Alexi, Facundo, you have the floor. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all for being here on this early morning for the best talk of the conference, apparently. Um, cool. So when I imagine air gap networks, I see things just like this picture in my mind. Um, small castles, totally cut off from the internet to protect the most sensitive stuff. Top secret documents, uh, power grids, nuclear centrifuges maybe. But whenever we analyze uh, a new malware that seems to target these types of network, not gonna lie, there's a little bit of adrenaline rush because we know we're looking at uh, something like a tool that an attacker devised to attack something of great value that probably went unnoticed for too long. Hold on, yep. So uh, my name is Alexi, um, I'm a senior manager uh, at ESET. I'm here with Facundo, man uh, manager, yeah, not yet. <laughs> uh, researcher uh, in my team, in my Montreal team. Um, and we are here this morning to discuss uh, how threat actors have been attacking air gap networks with malware specifically built uh, to operate in these restricted environments. You'd think this type of malware is uh, pretty rare, which is kind of true, um, but in 2020 alone, four uh, new frameworks uh, were exposed, uh, previously unknown frameworks, and that's what prompted us to revisit this whole category of, of malware and put all of them in perspective to try and understand how they work uh, and see if we could come up with some effective detection and defense mechanisms. And actually we published um, the result of this study in a white paper a few months ago uh, on our uh, company uh, blog. And uh, today we'll just summarize some of the key findings of that study. And so first we needed to uh, agree <laughs> among, among us what uh, constitutes a malware that targets an air gap network uh, because there are no predefined definition out there, at least from a purely technical perspective. So this is the definition we use for this, for this research. So it's a malware or a set of malware components acting together, a framework, that implements an offline covert communication mechanism between an air gap system and the attacker. And we believe it all started a little over 15 years ago uh, with uh, APT28, who developed and used a malware called USB Stealer as early as in 2005. And then followed 16 other frameworks developed by other threat actors for a grand total of 17 up to this day. And a few of these frameworks have been attributed with pretty high confidence to well-known threat actors, such as Dark Hotel, Mustang Panda, um, but for others, the attribution has been less clear cut or uh, flat out controversial. But uh, regardless of uh, the exact attribution, we can uh, really state that they were all a product of nation state actors, uh, hence the title of our research, 15 years of nation state efforts. So in our analysis, we studied the, uh, all the existing reports uh, are there and um, we compared them based on several properties with a, a specific focus on uh, those that are really tied to uh, air gap networks, such as how does the malware actually get executed on a system that's on the air gap side of the network, and how does the malware establish a communication channel with the attacker um, to effectively jump uh, the, uh, the air gap. And so for this, we formalized uh, the anatomy of air gap networks, but from really the malware perspective. And we came up with two distinct categories, connected and offline frameworks, so let me show you how that looks like. So most frameworks uh, belong to that category, the connected frameworks. Um, those are built to provide fully remote end-to-end -end connectivity over the internet between the attacker and the compromised systems on the air gap side. So we consider the target network as having two sides separated by an air gap. So at the top, you've got the connected side where um, the systems have uh, internet connectivity. And at the bottom is the air gap side, that's where the attacker really wants to get to. And that's a fairly typical setup um, because people who work with air gap system also need uh, the internet to do their regular uh, activity, uh, browsing the net, getting emails, and naturally that connected system will be the remote attacker's initial target, the point of entry, if you will. So techniques used to gain control of that connected system are not so interesting, they're similar to what we see in everyday attack. What differs is the type of payload that gets deployed. So one thing that payload will do is it will wait for a USB drive to be plugged in and it will weaponize it. And that usually means two things. 
uh, there, was, there, there will be a malware component that will be copied on the drive, uh, and it's a component, a sample, uh, that is meant to be really run on the air gap side. And there will also be a, an some sort of execution vector, something to launch or trigger the malware to execute itself. It can be an exploit decoy document, uh, trojanized uh, uh, software. Uh, Facundo here will be uh, talking about that in uh, a bit more details later on. So when the drive, uh, the weaponized drive gets inserted in the air gap system, that's when the execution vector uh, triggers and the system becomes uh, compromised. And that malware running on the air gap side uh, will typically do some automated reconnaissance and file stealing uh, activity and copy all that data back on the USB drive in real, uh, real funky ways. Um, again, Facundo will give some, some great details later. Um, so that's the exfiltration part from the air gap system, but that's not enough. The data needs still to reach the attacker, right? And for that, the drive containing the data needs to be connected again on the connected system, um, and the malware running there will automatically extract the data and relay it back to the attacker through, uh, um, via the internet through some, some, some sort of C2 um, protocol. And all these steps uh, will take place automatically without uh, any intervention from the attacker. Um, some, some frameworks are, are built just like that. Um, everything is hard coded, but other frameworks are more evolved and they actually have a communication protocol that allows the attacker to interactively um, uh, exchange commands and responses with the isolated systems. And so in these cases, we'll really see two distinct protocols. One that uh, goes over the internet that will connect the attacker to the connected system, and another one that is between the connected system and the air gap one. Um, so the connected system really acts, acts as a proxy for the attacker. In uh, other rarer cases, um, the attack scenario doesn't involve any connected system on the, on the victim's side. Uh, so we call these offline frameworks, uh, but you can think of them as uh, mission impossible frameworks because in these cases, everything indicates uh, that there's a presence of an operator or, or, or um, a collaborator on the ground to perform some of the critical actions, uh, such as weaponizing the USB drive or even physically carrying the drive uh, to execute the payload and leave with, uh, with the stolen data. And now I'll pass the mic to Facundo, who'll give some details about uh, some pretty interesting uh, TTPs. And uh, uh, just a quick note, uh, it's Facundo's first ever presentation, so I hope you'll give him uh, some support. Uh, so as Alexis said, uh, we focus on the malware properties that are specific to attacking the air gap networks. We divided into three broad categories all the techniques to execute the malicious code for the purpose of gaining a foothold in the network or conducting reconnaissance of uh, potentially air gap systems. Uh, these three categories are automated execution, non-automated execution, unknowingly triggered, non-automated execution, deliberately performed. So let's begin with the automated execution. Exploiting the remote uh, code execution vulnerabilities is one of the most effective techniques to execute the malware. 11 such vulnerabilities have been discovered and patched in the last decade, and only two have confirmed use in the wild. Uh, the most famous one is, without a doubt, the Stuxnet LNK exploit which only required a user to view an LNK files through Windows Explorer to trigger the vulnerability. However, it was later discovered by Kaspersky researchers that the question group Fanny had been exploiting this vulnerability since at least 2008. And even after malware released a patch in 2010, Fanny, Gauss, and Miniflame continued to use it uh, for five more years, more or less. But since the discovery of this malware, no other base, exploit-based uh, code execution has been observed in the wild to compromise air gap networks. For our next category, we take a step back from the complexity of software vulnerabilities and uh, 
Instead, we focus on the human factor and deception tricks. Uh, in this scenario, the aim is to trick an unsuspecting user into executing the malicious code. We also sell three techniques. One is the abuse of Windows auto run and auto play feature, the planting decoy files to lure the potential victims, and rigging uh, fi existing files with malicious code, for example. Uh, Dark Hotel, APT, uh, Retro Malware uh, replaced uh, do uh, Word Office documents with RTF copies that contain an exploit that will launch the malware on the system. And also, RANSI by Dark Hotel will uh, infect uh, executable files in all of the drives that were available, so that's uh, kind of uh, old school virus stuff. Uh, USB, uh, but now, at least uh, five of the 17 frameworks have abused uh, the auto run and auto play in one way or another. Uh, USB Stealer and Agent BTC, as well as an earlier version of Stuxnet that implemented an auto run file that contained both the executable and the auto run instructions. It disabled the auto play to force the user to go to my computer or use the entry in the navigation tree of Windows Explorer and with shell with the shell DLL it add an additional open command to the context menu that executed Stuxnet if the potential victim uh, clicks or double clicks on the, the drive shortcut. Now Mustang Panda custom Plugex malware uses a much simple trick. It hides all the existing folders in the drive and creates LNK files uh, for each one pointing to the malicious executable in the recycle bin folder. This technique kind of uh, preserves the appearance that the drive is uh, clean. Now, perhaps uh, the techniques under this last category are the most puzzling. The analysis indicates that the attackers did not intend uh, for a user to execute the malicious code, but it appears that the concept of operation uh, was to have a human asset covertly execute the malicious components in the target network. Now, how do you think as malware research that we can identify such scenario? That's it. <laughs> Let's take in a, this uh, interesting case of a uh, USB culprit by the APT cycle dead, also known as Goblin Panda. Hey, Mark. In this case, the, cor the code running on the connected side responsible for weaponizing the designated USB drives copies the malware for the air gap system in a hidden folder on the drive without any execution vector. The analysis indicates that the only possible way for that malware to execute it is someone knows exactly where the malware is hidden and launches it deliberately. So, and there is no indication that it is uh, part of an update mechanism on the air gap side. Now, in 2015, we discovered uh, malware on a mission, uh, something like this. We called it the uh, USB TIFF. At the time, we could not attribute this uh, sophisticated malware to any known groups, uh, but it was until two years later when uh, the Vault 7 leaks occurred that we began to suspect that this malware was part of the Lambert's APT group toolkit. Um, New findings helped us to narrow down the candidates in, in this corpus of, of the leak to an implant code name Margarita. The description of, of this system fits both this scenario and the capabilities that we found on USB TIFF. The human asset, uh, let's call him Tom, will weaponize the USB and create uh, circumstances 
uh, in the target machine in which he will have to see certain files on the USB drive. He will launch a Notepad, a Firefox, or TrueCrypt's uh, trojanized applications, and the software will in turn silently load the malware, and in the background it prepares the data for exfiltration. Finally, <clears throat> on that note, uh, getting the malware executed on the target just uh, one part of the mission. The collected information uh, needs a way to leave the ERGAT system and safely reach the attackers. We will now present uh, uh, what we consider some of the coolest ways that the attackers have managed to achieve this goal. So, going back to 2008, uh, funny, the funny malware sets the bar already too high for even some of the most sophisticated malware that were developed after, like uh, Safe Flame, uh, Gauss, uh, Project Zauron. And at the same, the same time, in the, developed by groups that are at the same uh, technical skill level. Uh, one of funny most interesting uh, features is the capability to create a hidden storage space in the USB drive that use a FAT file system. Remember that this malware is a little bit old. So. They achieved this by creating a directory entry with a combination of two attributes that make it, uh, that make it uh, basically invalid for, for the parser. So when the Windows uh, finds such an entry, it, it is ignored and essentially it is invisible to the, to the user and basically to any other tool. This entry contains an offset to locate the unallocated space of almost one megabyte in size, which contains the collected information as well as both uh, the, the commands, the modules, and stolen data, and the result of executing these uh, commands. It's also worth noting that Funny, uh, the flame, sorry, uh, uses a similar trick, but instead of creating this uh, directory, it directly creates a file with an invalid name that Windows ignores because the invalid name is just uh, the dot. The, so that's nice. That's a more optimized technique. Now, uh, Ramsey is a malware that we discovered in 2020 and we attribute to their hotel, as I said. Uh, the attackers came up with a decentralized way to spread the, the stolen information around the system drives as well as the network and removal drives. When RANSI is executed into a foreign process, it will hook the closed handle API, and when the hook is executed, it checks for the extension of the file that uh, was opened by the process. If it is a Word document, it will open a special container that encapsulates uh, all the collected and compressed information. This same container is also appended to every Word document that is found in the available drive. Ramsey uh, follows the same philosophy to receive commands. It will look for all the types of files which might potentially have appended uh, another type of uh, con a container with instruction to ex execute say, certain modules or uh, batch commands on the system at a specific uh, target machine based on the GUID that, that is only unique to every infected machine. Now, to Alex. All right, so how to defend against those, those types of attacks? Um, so there are a couple of uh, proposals in our paper, but if you have to remember only one thing from our talk is that it's always, always, always about USB drives, okay? So there has been no publicly reported cases where any other physical med medium uh, was used to jump the, the air gap, no electromagnetic, electromagnetic signals, no acoustic signals, uh, nothing esoteric like that, so just USB drives. Um, so how to make it harder for attackers to use that, uh, those drives to compromise uh, air gap networks? So uh, obviously physically disabling USB drives on the systems that don't, need, that don't uh, require um, that, that connector. 
Uh, for the remaining systems where USB is necessary, um, there are some policies that can be implemented in, in uh, Windows uh, to disable file execution uh, when they come from uh, remo removable drives. Voila. And uh, we can also think of implementing a, like a middle box that would sanitize USB drives whenever they go back and forth uh, between the, the, the two network sides. Um, and that, that station could, for example, remove unwanted file, ty file types like uh, LNK and autorun files and uh, perform uh, anti-malware scan. Uh, of course, that won't prevent um, um, an attacker on, on the ground to just not or to bypass that policy, uh, but still that, uh, that box would, um, would really uh, interfere with uh, lots of attack tactics we've seen uh, used uh, even recently. So that's how to defend, um, and since many of us here are malware analysts, um, I also wanted to share some, some quick uh, tips or things to keep in mind uh, when analyzing that type of malware. Um, and so remember that most frameworks are connected and uh, will have two distinct components, uh, one running on the connected side, one on the air gap side. Um, so to get a full picture of the attack, you'll need to find and analyze two different samples. So if you only have one, chances are you're missing the other one and you should look for it. And so when you analyze one, or, uh, one, of one sample, you should try and determine uh, quickly which side the component is meant to be executed in. Um, and uh, understanding that early on in the analysis will really help uh, focus your work and uh, you'll have a better understanding of, of the whole attack much, uh, much faster. Now to identify a connected side component, uh, you can look for their three main properties. So the first one will be a function to, to go online and communicate with a C2. Obviously, that's not really specific, uh, but at least it's going to tell you that that uh, sample is not meant to be run on the air gap side. Second property, there will be code to weaponize uh, USB drives. But careful, uh, don't jump to conclusions because you, uh, you might just be analyzing a simple USB worm that has nothing to do with air gap system. And uh, finally, there will be code to read the content of USB drives to extract the exfiltrated data and then relay it back to the attacker. As for the air gap side component, uh, the main thing that will be present there is code that will perform reconnaissance and uh, search for files to steal. And of course, code that will write that data back on the USB drive. Um, and one thing that probably won't be there is code that uh, communicates with the internet. And all that seems pretty, um, pretty normal, pretty basic, but I still wanted to, uh, to mention it today because so we, we read, what, 20-something 20, 20 reports, Facundo and I, and in many cases, some of those key properties of the samples that were described uh, were just not, uh, not described, and it made the, the whole uh, understanding of how the attack took place pretty confusing. Um, so if you're about to write a report, um, I encourage you to pay attention to these components and to, and to make sure that they are described in your analysis. Um, and uh, in closing, uh, so malware that attacks air gap uh, networks are challenging to analyze, uh, not only from the technical perspective, but also because samples are hard to come by. Um, air gap systems don't always uh, have anti-malware solutions running, and if they do, uh, by definition, they won't be sending telemetry back to vendors, which creates a huge blind spot for us. And at the same time, attacks happen in really sensitive networks, uh, so victims are not likely uh, to share uh, information with, with researchers uh, or to make any uh, details of, of any attack public. And uh, an example of, of samples that are hard to come by, that's um, a good example is, is Ramsey. Um, the research started by um, spotting a Trojanized 7-zip uh, installer on VarsTotal and we eventually de determined that that was the component met, meant to run on the air gap side. And we started looking for the missing component, the other one that would be running on the connected side and that would parse the Ramsey containers, extract the stolen data and give it back to the attacker. And this is a real screenshot of our internal wiki um, and that task remains incomplete uh, two years after, uh, after that, uh, that work. Um, so who knows, maybe that sample will eventually come up and we'll uh, figure out how uh, Dark Hotel really operates uh, the Ramsey framework. 
So thank you all for your attention. Uh, if you ever come across uh, some, some, some malware you think is targeting air gap networks, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, I assure you we'll honor any TLP uh, you decide. Um, and I know recently that there has been a few incidents about TLP uh, being breached um, and some, some trusted relationships uh, were, were a bit shaken. Um, and it would be easy to just decide to stop sharing altogether, it's much simpler. Uh, but that would really be a mistake. I think we just need even more information sharing than ever. Um, so there are many trustworthy people uh, out there, trustworthy organizations, uh, so just don't give up just yet. Thank you. <laughs> we got a fan here. So you have a question? Hi, Pedro Molino from Midside. So great presentation, thank you. Um, so there are other many uh, fascinating ways to exfiltrate you know, data from air gap systems, uh, such as acoustic, uh, electromagnetic emissions, air hopper, like, like you said. Why do you think we don't see that in the, in the wild? Do you think it's not really, uh, from the operational point of view, working, or we just don't find those samples? I can venture an answer. Um, your guess is as good as mine. Um, I d probably there are some. I mean, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, what's being reported publicly, right? Um, but on the other hand, those techniques, they still have to be implemented by, by malware, right? So we have quite a, I, I think we have a good visibility as, as, a, as a global community in malware, and, malware specifically, and if, if we don't discover it today, we're gonna discover it later on. Um, but, but the point I wanted to make is that those techniques you mentioned, they make the headlines. They make uh, great presentations at Black Hat and everything, and I think there's a lot of attention being given to those techniques, even though they haven't been seen in the wall, and even though even in, in recent years, it's, everything is going through USB, because USB works. I assume. So before, like implementing a big Faraday cage around your air gap systems, make sure you tackle the USB problem first, and then move on to something more complicated. Yeah. Thank you. Quick question, how many of the samples were targeted on, on OT or SCADA systems out of the 17, because a number of the air-gapped systems, or many of them, you will have the top secret, blah, 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 but another number of air-gapped systems are the ones you spoke of the power grades, or power grade maybe not, but production. And so how many of the samples were targeted on OT or SCADA systems? Just one? I think, no, but I think it's just, just Suxnet. The, so the goal of all the 16 others were clearly Espionage, file stealing. Um, only Stuxnet had, a, let's say, an operational mission. Um, although there was some file stealing capability, um, but yeah. Another question. Vitaly left. You have a question. Could we say that these attacks are closely aligned to insider attacks? So for the cases where the, um, the execution vector doesn't exist, like the one Facundo mentioned where the malware meant to be executed is hidden and there's, like, there's no way a normal user would know where to look, like would, would fall for it and, and execute it inadvertently, uh, in those cases, yeah an insider job would really make sense. Um, but that's not the majority of the cases, um, especially for the frameworks that are connected where the whole chain starts from remotely and then there's a USB drive getting weaponized. Um, so there, there are some cases, yeah, it's pretty clear that there's someone on the inside or someone on the outside but kind of breaking in and doing something bad. Um,
uh, follow-on question. What are the, are there trends in the data targeting mechanisms? So once you have this autonomous malware on the air-gapped system, it needs to retrieve data. So are there data types that they typically go after? How does the targeting system work? Do you see trends in that? Do you have any ideas on this? Uh, yeah, it's mostly uh, the basic basic stuff. They go after documents, and in, in some special cases, they go after like uh, AutoCAD files and that 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 type of stuff. The, mainly, there is no nothing much surprising there. It's let's say it's just like other regular malware trying to siphon all of the data that they can. And in in some cases, the list of like file extensions would be hard coded and. There's no other way for the attacker. So basically, the attacker knew in advance what files they wanted to go, to go for and, and nothing more. And um, like the case of uh, USB stealer, there are so many USB. <laughs> the, the, the APT28 one, there, there was no way for the attacker to request additional file extensions. It was a one-time thing. These are the files, extract everything, and, and move on. Last question, yeah, up there. Thanks a lot for the presentation, Sarkadi, head of CERTU. So just a comment on the defense. So one thing I have seen implemented to also try to defeat kind of like the insider threat is basically um, when you, like the operator, takes the USB drive from the connected system, he connects it to, he has to connect it to a different system, running, for example, Linux, mm -hmm which kind of like images the drive, then pass it on to the uh, air gap system. And then afterward, he has to plug it back to the Linux system, again, another image, and also see if there are um, elements that have been copied from the uh, air gap system, and then plug it back to the connected system. Uh, and he, if the operator does not do that, so every day at the end of the day, there is a sysadmin who comes to the Linux box and check also, they have systems on the connected system and the air gap system to match the three entries and ensure there is kind of like no gaps or something that has been installed. So uh, this is kind of like a uh, variant on the anti-malware or sanitizer. That makes total sense, and that would break like probably all the attacks that that we that have been documented. Yeah. Uh, so I see it implemented uh, uh, once um, in in real life, <laughs> and I think I, I found that very neat. It is very neat, yeah. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you. Another question? One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.